Oh, my name's Mike Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm delighted to get to know all of you. Okay. Um, Quick question. Would you like us to stand by? I would. Uh, thank you. I would like for, for the presentation to be standing in sort of front of the table there. Um, would you like me to set it up first? Yeah, hang on, let me set up this first. Because <laughs> I'm not very good at this stuff. Okay. okay. I'm not going to start this till you finish your background. Wonderful. So we are a consulting firm talking about, we're talking to the Uber Technologies Board of Directors, and we are talking about the issue of a contractor versus a employee and what uh, responsibilities the company has towards those contractors. Okay, and your name? And my name is Jocelyn. Okay. Good. Uh, right. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. I know how to do this. Come on. Don't fail me. Now. Mm -hmm. Got it. Ladies and gentlemen, today we've talked a great deal about the legal and financial dimensions of our issue. But I am surprised to say that we haven't talked about the most important topic, and that is ethics. Well, why ethics, you may ask then. I'd like, to, I'd like for you to allow me to ask a hypothetical question. Who is protecting the drivers that you created in your shared economy? As the primary stakeholders in your company, how are we making sure that those stakeholders are getting at least the minimal standard of living? Our primary stakeholders are working without perks, perks that they might not even realize they want or need. You can call them micro-entrepreneurs, you can call them contractors, you can call them whatever you like. But if they get hurt on the job, it is their responsibility to fix the situation. If they get robbed, it is their problem to fix. If there is a car accident or a drunk passenger harms their vehicle, it is primarily their issue to solve. Is it fair and ethical for us to let them gamble between safety and an extra income? The simple solution, the simple answer to that is no, which is why it is pivotal for you to support the suppliers of your service. It is pivotal for you to protect your drivers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much. Nice. Um, who's next? It's uh, okay. BC. I say BC because I live only a mile from Boston College, and I say it's <laughs> so uh, I won't start until you kind of set the stage. Okay. Hi, my name is Audrey Cynthia Dharma. Um, do you mind if I start? Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, I thought you wanted like to say what kind of case you were, yeah. you know, what's the case about? Um, so the chocolate industry as a whole sources most of its cocoa from West Africa, where they use child Slavery. Are you starting now? No, I'm not. Okay, good. Background information. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's about. Tell us again. So, the idea is that we're business ethics consultants, um, internal for Hershey's, and this is kind of like a progress report on how we're achieving our goal to use 100% sustainable cocoa by 2020. Um, okay. You ready? Hang on. While Hershey's is committed to using 100% ethically sourced cocoa by 2020, we're not there yet. And before we get there, we need to ask ourselves, do we need to tell our consumers that the chocolate we're using has been farmed by child slaves? I think we do. To quote our own code of conduct, it says that we should never misstate the facts or mislead consumers with anything from advertising to product packages. The consumer needs to make needs to be able to make fully informed decisions. Right now, our website lists the ethical hurdles we face in the supply chain, as well as the initiatives we take in trying to fix them. But for consumers to access that information, they practically need to be researching the topic already. So how do we get that information across to consumers who don't know to look it up? Well, if a significant amount of our consumers don't know about this information, then it isn't widely accessible. And if it's not widely accessible, then isn't that the same as omitting information about our products? 
That's misleading to our consumers, which is what our code of conduct says not to do. We have a real chance here to inspire change in the industry. Um, this isn't just Hershey's problem, it's a, cho it's a problem for any uh, chocolate company. If we have the opportunity to become ethical leaders and inspire real change by disclosing this kind of information on our products. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so we've got two talks already down, one about Uber and one about uh, Hershey's and uh, their business with uh, Coca, right? Interesting stuff. Uh, how did you get involved in thinking about Uber? Was that, I know that must have been your, your, your full presentation. <laughs> and uh, um, we, I feel like every single one of us who's in college right now uses Uber. Uh -huh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so we either drive it or we are passengers in it. And yeah. it just seemed really interesting. Plus there's like, there's a lot of lawsuits going against yeah. Uber, so I thought it, we thought it would be nice to kind of tackle at least one topic, and yeah. because they're a disruptor in, our, in the industry, it would be interesting to talk about it and see a solution, because if there's a solution for the in the peer-to-peer peer -peer economy, then there's like Lyft and Airbnb and all these other companies that look, can look up to Uber yeah. if there's a solution found to how to deal with contractors. Yeah. Yeah. I meant to believe, well, you can probably believe it because of my age, but I've never used it in person. You should go. Just right there. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. I, um, but they need to take care of their employees right now. And how Hershey's, how did you get onto that? Um, well, our, my team and I really like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. Yeah. And people don't really consider, like, the ethics about, like, and the sustainability of, like, chocolate and where it comes from and stuff like that. So yeah. when we did a little bit more research, um, we found that the ethics of like cocoa sourcing and all that stuff gets really like shady and we wanted to talk yeah. about it more. Have you ever heard of Taza chocolate? Yes. Yeah, we had the CEO of Taza chocolate come and give a talk at that point. He was very good. Uh, but he, you know, one of the reasons we wanted him to come is because they take the sourcing of cocoa very seriously and are trying to do it in the right way. So I was particularly interested in the cocoa program. <clears throat> okay, so next up is Mount Holyoke. A little bit about what you're gonna talk about. Okay, so the idea is that we're a, a, woman's, a, woman, a woman run ethics company who specializes on women's issues and we're, we were hired by Victoria's Secret to discuss the ethical implications of their business. Earlier we spoke to the board of directors and we spoke to senior managers. They said no, we're speaking to employees within this, like I'm an employee speaking to fellow employees about okay. what's going on. In so it's like a, maybe a committee meeting and you're talking to your fellow colleagues? Yes, that's the same. Okay, and uh, it's a women's, did you say ethics business? So, so, so right now, I'm acting as an employee, talking to fellow employees right. about the ethical implications of Victoria's Secrets. About the ethical implications of? Of Victoria's Secrets. Like their brand Victoria's their brand Secrets? Secrets. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm interested. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> uh, I'll tell you the story later. Oh, <laughs> I want to hear it. Okay. Are uh, you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Did you tell us your name? Oh, my name is Shay McDonald. My name is Shanae McDonald, but I go by Shay because it's simpler. Shay? Yeah. Okay. Just rolls off your tongue. All right, I'm going to punch it. Go ahead. All right. I think what's missing from this conversation is the ethical implications. Do you remember last week when that little girl and her mom came into the store? And she came to get sized for a bra, but we took one look at her and realized that we did not have her size. The disheartening look that flashed across her face and she burst into tears. Do you remember you tried to come and calm her and you said to her mom, go and check out her pink line. The mom comes back blazing upset that we are hypersexualizing young women with taglines such as bright young things and kiss me put in provocative places. I remember this moment because at that time that little girl was standing next to a picture of one of her angels with the tagline, the perfect body. I know at that moment she was questioning to herself, why am I not perfect? Why am I not enough? 
You see, I started working for this company because I strongly believed in the values of diversity and inclusion. Yet, the way we market and brand ourselves, we're necessarily excluding a significant portion of this population. Having ranges from size zero to size two, models who are, who are six, feet, six feet tall, people who fit a narrow Eurocentric view of beauty, don't you not realize the ethical implications and the psychological effects that this has on a woman? Women are to be valued, and though our company says in one breath that we value them, we turn around and do another thing. If we recognize this, we can perform ethically. Thank you. And your name is again? Stephanie Swartz. Stephanie, and you're representing University of Miami? Yes, sir, I am. You got a good tan, I can tell. Where <laughs> you're uh, Sunshine so, view, that's what they call yeah. it. So. Okay, so uh, I'm going to hold up my hand when it's 10 seconds okay. to go. Thank you. And if you're ready, I'm ready. No, I'm not ready. <laughs> now I'm ready. Okay, over 15 million Americans suffer from anaphylaxis yearly. Um, as, a as a result of the over 500% increase in price in our EpiPen product, people have died and will continue to die. It's well accepted and understood in our industry that innovation comes at a cost. However, the EpiPen product has been established and incorporated into homes and educational systems within the United States since the 1970s. This is not a new product. Because of the recent price increases, we've completely barred off access to low-income families. In addition, because of the life-saving nature of this product, people will be willing to pay whatever cost necessary to receive access to this drug. And although, as an industry, we do have a right to make a profit, we do not have any right to extort exorbitant amounts of money from desperate consumers. In addition to this ethical implication, there's also the right to health care. In the UN's constitution, it states that there's a universal right to health care. And within that right is an access to life-saving and essential medicines and treatments. As a one-dose life-saving medication, the EpiPen is surely incorporated into this right to healthcare. As a pharmaceutical company, we made a commitment to improving the standard of living and quality of life of our consumers. And by exploiting them in such a way, we are not doing so. Mylan needs to seriously consider the deathly implications of these ethical considerations in pricing and accessibility. Thank you. Relevant in the media as our team was discussing what was going on. Um, I also personally have a cousin who suffers from like a lot huh? of allergies, so okay. I'm close to home. So it was personal too. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you pick out your case? Are so, you a, a Victoria's Secret customer? <laughs> as you can imagine, as a woman, like everybody shops at Victoria's Secret is so popular, but sometimes the way that they represent women, especially with the recent fashion show, it just kind yeah. of feel disconnected from us. So then we started thinking this is an issue that whether you're a consumer or you're just a, you're just a family friend or a relative of, of a woman, this is something that you can relate to and it's something that they often just boil down to like marketing choice, but it's much bigger than marketing choice. So we decided to just run with it. Yeah, no, it's an interesting case. Yeah, I mean, an interesting topic. Uh, I felt it was interesting when I walked into the store with my mother. <laughs> I had never been into one. And, uh, yeah, it does kind of make women who aren't the perfect bodies feel maybe left out, degraded. I, I uh, yeah, I think that's, that's right. And so now we've got uh, Stetson. Ready. Yes, sir, last but not least. All right, uh, let me get my thing set up here. Future Chippendale. Tell us a little bit of who are you and what are you talking about? Today? My name is Nate Smith. I'm from Stetson University, and I'm currently going to be sitting in a boardroom where we talk about the financial and the legal obligation of the company, but no one's brought up ethical yet, and that's why I'm here. Specifically, adhering to the uh, our credo, Johnson and Johnson, also the off-label uh, marketing schemes. So. Uh, it's 
This case is specifically about J and J. Yes, sir. J and J. Okay. You tell me when you're ready. Our value as a company does not rest upon shady deals or skirting around the law, but being transparent with our consumers, whether in a boardroom or out in public. Loyalty has no price, which is why we must be remain strong to the ideals that have been promoted in our credo, as well as the promise that we made to consumers for 131 years. In our credo, we specifically state that everything we do must have a high value whether it's how we treat our customers, our doctors, our stakeholders, constantly. We are an innovator in this industry, and we are also developing leaders, which is why J&J is not just another number on a balance sheet. We are, we are Johnson & Johnson. We do not base our value of how much money we make, but off the impact that we have on our consumers. We must remain transparent in all of our marketing schemes to make sure that we can gain the trust of our consumers. The amount of consumers that we have lost has been more money that has left our pockets. Just as a rock makes a ripple in the river, so do the actions of our company to display and properly convey our brand to the public. So I urge you, come to the water with me and let's make a ripple. Johnson and Johnson must adhere to the values in our credo and stay strong. Yes, sir, um, how did you how did you pick J and J as a topic? It was uh, so we were we were researching some pharmaceutical industries that we thought may be a little controversial, and Johnson and Johnson came up. I shoot, I used baby wipes with Johnson and Johnson, so uh, it was a, it was a personal thing. A lot of us always use it. I mean, she was in a lot of stores, and we thought it was very relatable, especially in their marketing techniques that we've seen lately. Um, and then our case focused on you know specific cases mm -hmm. um, that it related to that as well. All right, nice job. Um, uh, it's in Florida. It's uh, like 20 minutes from Daytona. <laughs> it's, it's in the land. Uh, it's not, yeah, it's, it's in the land. <laughs> You're talking about where that's Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, and you said it was in the land? Yes, sir. The land. <laughs> the, land the land of opportunity, if you will. Okay. Got it. That's not just America, you know? That's particularly where it's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Well, I'm glad to know it's in the land. <laughs> I've heard of it. It's good school. Yes, sir. And uh, what what year are you? In? I'm a junior. I'm a finance and economics major. Yeah. Cool. Yes, Great. sir. Well, you know, I've got a very difficult job here. I've got to pick uh, two of you to take home some kind of prize tonight, and I'm going to spend the rest of the day worrying about it. <laughs> Uh, but you don't have to spend the rest of the day worrying about it. You can go out now and have fun. Your work is done. Yay. So, <laughs> well, you did a beautiful job. You worked hard to get uh, to get it uh, to where it was presented it today. You should be proud of yourself to go out and enjoy the sun and, and the weather. And we'll see you tonight at the uh, banquet. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.